What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Bischoff and Brown right here on the Detroit Lions Podcast Network. He's Scott Bischoff. I'm Russ Brown. We are back. I'm a little happier now than I was this morning when I woke up. Uh, just simply because I don't know, the, you kind of get over things. You kind of let the loss roll off your back. But our Detroit Lions are one and one. Uh, tough loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But uh, Scott, my man, how are you? I am doing very well. How are you? Other than feeling a little disgruntled, uh, I'm good. We're good. Um, good. Had had a good practice today, and um, outside of that, Lions focused. Nobody cares about me coaching high school football. We, we care about the Lions. That's why we're here. And it, we're just jumping right in. I mean, nothing cute here, nothing fancy. Lions get their first loss of the season. Game they should have won against the Bucs. They lose 20 to 16. I mean, we, we're, we're going to jump into the offense. We're going to jump into the defense. I mean, we're also I think we should this Monday evening. So forgive correct. us if there's information that we don't necessarily have or, you know, things... Yeah, uh, I mean, there's injury stuff that's that's shaking out now. That's just crazy. Week two is week two is brutal. I mean, week two is just awful around the NFL. Um, yeah, I, it's been a brutal start. Period. I mean, you look at week one. Kenneth Walker got banged up. Jordan Love got hurt. Isaiah Pacheco is hurt. Uh, we're looking at Cooper Cup injured. I mean, the Rams' whole roster seems to be going on IR. So um, Cooper, uh, Cooper Cup is apparently going to go to IR. It's not. Like it, they're expecting him to miss a, a a long stretch of time, so IR is very much a possibility. Debo, it just came out. Debo's missing. You're gonna miss at least a few games minimum. Yep. Um, Christian, Christian McCaffrey's missing games. Yeah, makes me wonder. And I apologize for interrupting you earlier. No, you're good. Um, it makes me wonder how much teams are gonna now reevaluate the preseason. Because we've seen this now for this is the second year where offenses have been, you know, go back last year, the, the week one, the offenses came out of the gate slow. Week two, same thing. Um, you know, last year was a, it was a change in the preseason model where they went to three games and teams didn't really play anybody in the preseason. Yeah. And the same thing this year. So week one was super slow. Um, you know, look at your fantasy scores. They're lower than than they will be in a few weeks, right? So right. week two, same thing. Um, shouldn't necessarily apply to the Lions because they threw so much. But Charlie. you know, um offenses everywhere are, are have struggled to come out of the gate. And I wonder I wonder what it's gonna take for team for some super smart team to look at these at this first, you know, quarter of the season and say Everybody else doesn't really care or isn't really uh, playing efficiently early in the season. We can steamroll our way to three and zero if we yeah. come out of the gate strong, but then you're carrying some risk. Right. You know, these injuries are going to pop up, but a lot of these injuries, some of, some of the soft tissue injuries and some of the muscle stuff is it can be related to the fact that they didn't take a lot of contact in camp. You know, well, so, and I. And I think what the Lions do in camp is carrying over to start the season offensively. I, you know, we know Panay Sewell was on the injury report going into the Bucks game. He was not a game time decision, but we weren't really sure if he was going to play until about Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning. And obviously he ended up playing, but he hasn't looked perfect. And he's never always, you know, he's never perfect, but he hasn't looked like the same Panay Sewell that we're used to seeing. Frank Ragnall, I, he played not great yesterday. Um, you look at Amon Ross St. Brown, he's now banged up a little bit. Uh, Tyrion Arnold got banged up a little bit. Rake Straw got hurt during pregame warmups yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's like, I think the Lions carry their practices and some are way different than other teams. So I know it doesn't apply to them as much as it does to a team like the 49ers or the Seahawks and so on and so forth. But it is still a little concerning that some of these injuries are popping up. I mean, we kind of expect it like Marcus Davenport to get hurt. We we kind of figured it would be like one game on, two games Probably off, one, right? But yeah, right, yeah, right. But, but, but you know, we got some positives. DJ Reader came back. Tieran Arnold got banged up, but he played the rest of the game. Brian Branch is back, healthy. He looks he looks really good. And and that's where I was going to start today, just focusing on the positives because we are going to get into the offense. 
Yeah. Looking at the defense, I mean, we were talking about this before the show. Holy, holy shit, does Aiden Hutchinson look like just a step more explosive, as you said, twitchier, had five sacks yesterday. And I know, you know, uh, the, the, the Bucks were banged up on the offensive line. Their right tackle was out. They had Justin Schuyl starting. I understand all of that, but still to have five sacks, that is ridiculous. And the, the way he's playing, he is the number one defensive end right now in the National Football League statistically from pressures, uh, tackles for loss, sacks, and those types of things. He's playing at an incredible pace. And he might have a record setting year right now. And then just Brian Branch, what a stud. I mean, what a stud. Great bounce back performance for him. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to look at, we're going to look back at that draft and other teams are going to think the same thing. And it's going to be how, how, how did we not, how did we let Branch fall to where the Lions yeah. are getting? Like, how does that happen? You know, um, it's just good fortune and and a bunch of other a bunch of really nice things going your way to to find a player like him, because I I mean I think it was pretty obvious watching him in Alabama, especially his last year there, he was everything for that defense, and he you know I mean this is early part of year two, but he's kind of putting himself on the map to be one of the most important players on their defense, yeah. and. The the exciting thing is is you got a ton of stuff around him that's really really exci- is good too you know so uh, let's let's talk about Terry and Arnold just for a second I know we got the pass interference early in the game um, I thought it was uh, while probably technically the right call to make because he he's just got to he's in phase so that's like yeah. the hardest part and and. The fact that he's in phase almost all the time makes me so hopeful for him. We all need to just, we all need to remember he is a rookie. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is his first year. That's tough, yeah. but he's in phase. He's not getting torched. Um, he gets a little grabby, but on this particular one, I thought it was nonsense, but I also can understand that some of the, you know, some, some other analysts or whatever you want to call them out there are saying it was the, it was technically the right call. That's fine. But you can't you can't make that call and then, you know, allow JMO to get effectively hugged twelve yards downfield and not call that. Like it, it, it just, I guess that's enough ref bitching. But you know what I'm yeah. saying. So I don't. I yeah. thought it was, I didn't think it was such an egregious penalty. And I like that he's in phase and he looks to understand, you know, where his body needs to be. And I think it's just. A little bit of uh, technical refinement with his hands, and and trying to just work that out. But I, he'll get there. The fact that yeah. he's in he's this young is good. It's really good. Yeah, I, and I mean, look, I haven't looked at uh, Arnold's PFF stats yet today, but looking at Pro Football Reference at their advanced defensive metrics, according to them, and they've got the Tampa game up there. He did not allow a catch yesterday, according to this. I don't know. How accurate that is, it shows eight eight uh, receptions allowed in week one with 68 yeah. yards and a score. We saw, obviously, the pass interference call. The score was definitely not on him in week one. Carlton Davis fell. Yes, and 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 he... I he did he definitely gave up a catch though in this game against the Bucks because he gave up that touchdown when he came inside. Mike Evans ran that post and he fell for that. He, he was playing cover three and... Kirby Joseph was right there and he left his zone and yesterday. So he Let did give me, up a catch. Uh, Godwin touchdown down the sideline. Yes. Yes. So I'm I'm sure he gave up his, but like you mentioned, he's a rookie, second game in the NFL, playing one of the toughest positions in football to develop. And like you mentioned, he's young. He's 21 years old. He turned 21 and in March. It's Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. And and Correct. also Baker Mayfield, uh, Mayfield like Playing at a very high level, yes. So, I, like, I'm I'm with you. I'm not going to hit no panic button on him. I'm not worried. You you said he's in phase. I agree with you. He's he's there. He's where he needs to be. He's getting closer and closer week by week. Maybe this is the week. I'm excited to watch it because he's probably going to match up with Marvin Harrison Jr. a lot. So I'm excited to see that. And I know Marvin Harrison Jr. is a dude. He looked much better yesterday than he did in week one. The timing with Kyler is there. That's a little concerning. But I trust that the Lions defense, the way that they've played, giving up 20 points in consecutive weeks 
the bend don't break. I mean, the, the turnover right off the rip from Jared Goff, they could have gave up a touchdown, could have been down 10 nothing. It was yep. only six nothing. I mean, you you yep. said it pre-show. They gave up a touchdown in the second half. Like they're yeah, so they positive. Seven points in the second half, and yeah, and, um, and I'll 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 say this: Jack Campbell looked good yesterday. He looked good yesterday. He made two tackles for loss. He was second on the team in tackles. Alex Anzalone goes down with the concussion. Jack Campbell steps up, and I thought he played a, a pretty good game. So like you're seeing the development from the guys that we've been talking about for the last year or two, or maybe even three. Levi Ozarike, another strong so- showing for him. Very so much. There's a lot of positives with this defense. And like I said, it starts with Hutchinson. It starts with Branch. But I love what we're seeing from Tyrion Arnold. I hope Rake Straw is back next week so we can see him. Amik Robertson did not play as much as I thought he would yesterday, um, but they also were on the field that much. They ran 48 offensive plays to the Lions, 85. Like the Lions should have won that game. Yeah. And that's where I want that's where I want to turn this thing to because the offensive execution to start the season right now is very problematic for what we expect out of Ben Johnson, Jared Goff, Amon Ra St. Brown, and this offense. I mean, what do you see? I, I I'll get into my host spiel, but what what are you seeing? Um that is a little bit alarming to you. Well, it just feels like um, I've been thinking about this all day, and and I I, I texted you some nonsense crap earlier, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> about motion and all this other stuff. And uh, but you're right. I don't know if I am to be to be totally true, uh, because I didn't watch snap by snap yesterday to see how much motion the Lions did did use. I do yeah. know that when they did use motion, it didn't mean anything to Tampa's defense. Like they you know, there are plays where you watch where, okay, they they bring um I'll talk well let's talk about the the low red zone play they they threw to JMO when he's double covered. Um they brought Laporta into the box and set him next to Sewell and had him block the edge defender. But Tampa literally their defenders literally didn't move so yeah. not only did you not necessarily learn it i mean i, I guess I, I suppose you could say they were they you knew they were playing zone at that point but they had so many defenders over there i don't know that you know that for sure right like yeah, lots right. of times we like to say if a guy comes with you with, when you run motion you, they're in man but there was two receivers and three defenders minimum on that side of the field so i don't know that tampa really gave anything away there but then you threw the ball into double coverage. Yeah. Which is just like super confusing for a Ben Johnson offense, right? Yeah. So um, I don't know what they're doing with motion uh, specific to like last year, I-, I thought they were one of the heavier motion teams in the NFL and they mm-hmm. got advantages doing it. You know, I'd love to say I, I looked at every snap today, but I didn't. So um, I guess the the thing that stands out most is that I, it's a combination of I think I think they are not I don't want to say forcing but it it almost seems like they're they have decided that they they want to be a little more explosive on offense and more chunk plays on offense with the ball in the air um, and less like they were the past couple of years where they got a lot of chunk plays through yards after catch. Yeah. Right. So yeah, yeah. The it's almost like they want to they want to air it out a little more vertical uh to accommodate JMO at the expense of some of their other players. It makes them less efficient. It also um and this has nothing to do with JMO that you need to you know, he's talented enough in a variety of ways that you gotta figure out a way to use him. But the desire to, the the lack of desire to run the ball and put yourself in good down and distance. Um, is something I think was was kind of them in a nutshell the last couple seasons was they were so run heavy and you know it's just what they were and then yeah. they would the short throwing game chunk yards uh, you know run after the catch all that stuff they've gone away from all that stuff and they've gotten I think almost like um, you know it's like uh, we talked I'm going to say it again it's like dude gets hair plugs and and normally goes to the beach and he's pulling sixes and sevens and now he's at the beach looking for nines and tens. Yeah. Uh, it's a great like analogy. 
right? I mean, that, that is what it looks like. So, you know, they're smart enough that I think if they if they recognize we're going for too much and it's making our quarterback almost too greedy in his decision making, that's what the whole thing feels like to me is that they're trying for too much and it's forcing Goff to be more reckless with where he's putting the ball. There's a play on, you put it on your Twitter, people can look at it. There's a play on third and two where they run a slot fade to Amon Ross St. Brown, who's just blanketed and covered. That, th- that throws an eye being completed. But maybe seven yards underneath St. Brown in the seam line of view is a wide open Laporta. And in the past, Goff would have just taken Laporta and said, cool, we'll take the first down. We'll take yep. the 13 or 14 yards we're going to get. But it just feels like they're forcing, uh, and that's the word I want to use, forcing their offense to be something that they're not. Uh, yep. The offensive line is built to run the football, and they got away from that yesterday when they ran it. When they Last thing I'll say, and then I, <laughs> this is going to go on forever. Last thing. When they when anything that they did laterally on offense yesterday didn't work. It mm-hmm. just didn't because Tampa runs Tampa blitzes so much and they run so much side to side that it's hard to beat them that way. And, and it yeah. was like the Lions play, wanted to play that game. And yeah. then the you know, the uh the last play on offense was I don't know what that was. Um throwing it short of the sticks and into the middle of the field with three defenders, even if it is Gibbs, if you if you make him stop his feet. With the throw, it's death. The play's over. Yeah. Um, but that's what it felt. It feels like to me is they're forcing Goff to make uh, decisions that aren't that aren't conducive to his game, and their efficiency on offense has just kind of gone down the tank. I well, and I I agree with you. And I think one of the things is is they are going to have to rep the hell out of cover one and cover three buzz looks from th- their scout defense because. It felt like almost every single time I would watch the offense yesterday, cover three buzz, cover three buzz, cover three buzz. You have the outside thirds covered. You have the middle third covered with a buzz defender. And it was creating that they, they were the, And the reason why I think the Bucks were doing it. And I think other teams are going to do it is because the Lions were really efficient last year running like a dagger concept with that dig route. And underneath that, you would find St. Brown or Sam Laporta or Sam Laporta would run the dig route or Josh Reynolds or whoever. I don't think it's necessarily they miss Josh Reynolds. I think it's more so their teams are taking that away because now they're they're either going to blitz or, and it seems like the like Tampa was blitzing backside a lot, yeah. but you are now getting linebackers, getting depth, getting a hook curl because you know Jared Goff's not going to run the football. So if, if, you take away his initial read and he cannot get in your blitzing backside. He can't check out to the flats because he's getting blitzed. Now every everything underneath short of the sticks, all you need now is your defenders to make a play. And Jordan Whitehead made a ton yesterday. Yeah. Jamel Dean did made a bunch. So that's like that's where I struggle with it. But I'm I'm what what bothers me the most is just the red zone efficiencies because this is a team that is second in total yardage in the NFL right now, despite being one and one and only scoring, you know, a total of 42 points on the season. They have they have put up 413 yards of offense on average this season per game. And when you look at it, they are three for eleven in the red zone this season. They were one for seven yesterday. So like that's where the problems lie. And it's sec, you know, first and goal from the 10, and you are throwing with you know, double coverage, or you get a seven yard gain on second and goal. And the the team of last year, the team of the year before would give it to Montgomery again, and then yeah. come back fourth and goal and give it to him a third time. Mm-hmm. And, and and yesterday you mentioned it, they throw a double cover to JMO while Sam Laporta's motioned in tight and he's max protecting. Well, now you have six players on the essentially offensive line versus five defenders. You're, you're, you're mismatched there. You might as well run the football. You have the numbers. Yeah. And it's just like, I, I just, I, I think they're forcing something to, to be These something that they're not. Five times yesterday. That's double of what they did the week before. It's and 55 times in a game where the team they played against scored seven times in the second half, or seven times, seven points in the second yeah. half. You lost a game. Just think about how crazy. We're going to look back at this one and think, this is nuts. 
You threw 55 times in a game where you lost to a team that only scored 20 points. You threw it 55 yeah. times. Yeah, wow. and, and the, the stat that's the craziest, and this is from Greg Allman, at Greg, at Greg Allman, uh, A-U-M-A-N. Great, great follow if you're a Bucks guy, a yeah. uh, draft guy. The Lions ran 28 plays in the fourth quarter, 23 of them. 23 of them were in Tampa's territory. Out of those 23, they ran the ball a total of seven times. One of those runs got called back for holding. So technically, they ran it six times for 49 yards. That's good for 8.16 yards per carry. Why that's they run away? Wizard, but that sounds pretty good. Yeah, and, and sure, two runs came on chunk plays, you know, 23 and 24-yard gains from Jameer Gibbs. But that's that's why you feed the ball to David Montgomery. So when the the thunder goes away and the lightning comes on, it hits and it strikes every single time. And they just, they were in their own way. And the crazy thing is, is if you look back over the last eight or nine months, 10 months, the Lions have had two losses, NFC championship game to the 49ers. And yesterday, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, not counting the preseason. The only reason why they've lost those two games is because of themselves. The only team beating Detroit is themselves. It's not like they are getting physically dominated like they did last year against the Baltimore Ravens and they had no shot. Yeah. This is what this is one of those where they had an opportunity and they're just golf is locking in on one guy or just two guys and first half he threw the ball 20 times, 14 of those targets were for St. Brown or Jamo, nobody else. Sam LaPorta had three targets yesterday. His stat line is identical to Tim Patrick who just got off the plane like that is that that cannot happen for a guy, especially a guy like that who had 10 touchdowns as a rookie, the best rookie season ever as a tight end. Eight of his touchdowns came in the red zone. Yeah. You should not have been one for seven in the red zone yesterday. So yes. I, I'm not saying wake I'm up saying cold, though. Like, right? Like yes. these yes. are smart it, guys. They know what they're doing. Um, if anything, the frustration about this kind of loss, I would hope forces them to go back to the things that they know work and yeah. the things that has worked in the, in the past. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, when you look at uh, Montgomery runs so heavy and you know, all that, when you look at the way, the way Gibbs moves, when he touches the ball, it it, it is amazing. It, the, the second gear he has as quickly as he gets it. Yep. And, and you know, so I'm and Ra got it going yesterday. Um, Jamison had a good game yesterday. He was dangerous. They need to get Laporta involved. The running backs yeah. look really good when they use them. You know, some of this stuff is. I think they'll work. They'll work some of this stuff out. It just, you know, I think they lost a touch of their identity and what they what has been super successful for the, for them in the past. I will tell everybody to follow you on Twitter because the, all these like a lot of these plays are things that you're popping onto your feed where people can watch and, and see why, you know, you do have numbers. It's frustrating that you would make that throw. Right. It's frustrating that you would call plays like that. Like, you know, motion, bringing, bringing Laporta back into the box and, and having the, I think having every, I want to say they slid the offensive line left and they, and they brought him back in to block the edge defender. Right. Um, but when you do some of that stuff, you can find running lanes and you knew all those things. Uh, that felt like a giveaway play to me to throw that double covered, you know, into, uh, you know, at the goal line towards the pylon for JMO. It, would, it needed to be a precise, uh, ridiculous throw when it doesn't need to be that complicated with what, with your offensive line and your backs. So, yeah. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> No, nope, I don't. One. This is a yep. bummer. It's going to be. This is going to be one of those games. I, it's the opposite of the Rams game, where I think the Rams, at least going into this week, they've lost so much. I don't know how they survived this, but um, and there's also some Stafford stuff that's really weird out there. Um, what is what I didn't, I didn't hear. So it's his contract that he anything in the future is gone after 2024, and then possibly trading him. It's really strange, but mm. that's out there. So, um, 
I thought the Rams win would look like a really important win at the end of the season, you know, and an NFC conference kind of win, a team that I thought would be in the playoffs. And I thought we talked about this last week. I thought the same thing about Tampa. Tampa's going to be in the playoffs. And to beat them, you know, inside your own conference is very important. It's a big yeah. loss for the same reason. Now you're behind them. Um, you know, for home field, I I it's crazy. It's week two. Jeez. Lighten up about the playoffs, but you know what I'm saying. Right. That stuff matters. So yeah. Uh, well, look, the, the the Lions will iron it out. No need to sound the alarms or get off the bandwagon. We all, all we no. all, no. we all are allowed to have a bad day at the office. We have them every single day. Everybody has a case of the Mondays. It was one of those days yesterday for Ben Johnson, and I get it. He makes a hell of a lot more money than you and I, and and everything else. I totally get it. And he's dealing with pro athletes and Jared Goff got the big deal. He's got to be better. I fully understand all of that. But sometimes you just get in your own way and it's okay. The Lions have an opportunity to fix it. Lions, Cardinals, Sunday, 4.15, 4.30, whatever time that's going to be, uh, Eastern Standard Time. What should we expect in this game against Kyler Murray, Marvin Harrison Jr.? We're looking at you know Paris Johnson up front, James Conner in the backfield. Are we going to see some Trey Benson? We saw a little Bucky Irving. So you know we're seeing some rookies three weeks in a row. You know Blake Corm didn't play that much week one. We saw a little bit of Bucky Irving. I believe he got banged up uh, yesterday. Could we see some Trey Benson? I'm really intrigued to see how it goes. But I, I will say this: the one player that I will highlight, and, and then I'll turn this over to you offensively, is not Marvin Harrison Jr. I, I want to say focus on Greg Dortch, the wide receiver, the slot receiver. He has great rapport with uh, Kyler Murray, and it just feels like whenever the Lions are matched up with kind of that shifty slot receiver, move receiver, he tends to go off and gets five or six catches. We saw it with Chris Godwin. He, he can play inside, outside. Greg Dorch can do that for the Cardinals offense. So I would keep tabs on him, especially if Rakestraw doesn't play and if Tyrion Arnold's limited at all. You know, Amik Robertson's going to have his hands full a little bit. Not saying Amik can't do it. Amik's a great yeah. player. I like, I love Amik, but Greg Dorch is a player that I would say keep tabs on. And if, and if Kyler Murray is going to be rolling out and those types of things and extending plays, yeah, he's going to want to force the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr., but you know the Lions are expecting that. Who's the player that's going to be left uncovered? I could see some scenarios where Greg Dortch has a pretty decent day for yeah. the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, it's a dangerous offense with with Kyler running around and stuff. It's it's uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., it's Dortch, it's Michael Wilson, and then it's Trey McBride, who's yeah, who's a dude, right? So yeah, uh, I loved him coming out of Colorado State. So I, I yes, I, I, um. To me, there are two things, and yes, it's early in the week, so the injuries are going to play a factor in all these things, and you're traveling, all that stuff. But it's how well do the Lions pass protect? And obviously, we're in in this scenario. We're talking about getting the offense untracked and you know playing a little better than they they did in week one and week two. Um, defensively, Kyler Murray will not stay in the pocket. Whether it's clean or not, doesn't matter, right? If 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 you could force him to stay in the pocket, he's such an accurate, a good accurate thrower of the football, he would be incredibly dangerous because he can he can layer throws, he throws with touch and anticipation, he can rip throws, he can do everything. It's just his his issues come with vacating the pocket in weird ways when when there's pressure or perceived pressure and i think some of that was exposed in week one when you see harrison go for one catch in four yards and yeah. they were they were very frustrated um and this is why i think this is why kyler murray makes the comment he did about you know that's up to the offensive coordinator uh if he's not in my progression he's not in my progression that's not my job right uh yeah. but when you leave the pocket and roll out you're eliminating half the field so if and your progressions change from that point on, there are no progressions. It's just right. Panic City. Who, if somebody's open and I can get it there, I'm getting it there. So yeah. I, I think if if Harrison, unless it's a sprint out pass like package, <laughs> yes. And if Harrison's on the wrong side of the play, yes, he's not a part of any way. They're they're just he's not a part of that. So can the Lions blitz and pressure him to get him uncomfortable and skittish? And yeah. if so. 
They can force him into some turnovers. He's playing at a really high level. The Cardinals are a dangerous offense. They're playing good on defense too. So this is a tough matchup. Uh, but you know, early in the week, those are the things that I think you know will be most important. Is what do the Lions look like? You know, in totality on offense, but more importantly, how do they how do they keep Goff in rhythm, in timing, and tempo, and and hopefully getting back to the things that have that has made them successful in the past, and yeah. then, um, doing it as much as they can to make Murray skittish and uncomfortable. And you can do that chasing them all over the place, but some of that's blitzing. And then it's uh, truly about finishing, getting him to the ground. Yeah. Or throwing the ball away. You know, yeah. I would consider it the throwaways that he makes sacks because mm-hmm. them, that, that team in third and long is not, not as effective as they, as they are. You know, uh, every team isn't, but specifically them. Um, third and long, you know, what's coming. So you're bringing it right. home. Uh, right. That to me is going to be really important to what to how this game plays out. But really interesting matchup. I don't think anybody oh, expected the Cardinals to look the way they have. And kudos, no, to I, is there playing a hundred, a hundred percent? Because it didn't look like that was going to be the case when he first got there. They kind yeah. of looked like a dumpster fire, and it was more so he had to restructure the roster and get certain guys to buy in. But now they have guys bought in. Yeah, and we'll see. I mean, they're defensively they're led by Buda Baker. Uh, Kaiser White, who I feel like Kaiser White has been in the league for like 15 years. He's been around for a long time. But I, I mentioned a lot of cover one buzz, cover three buzz stuff from the Bucks defense. We even saw from the Rams. If there's going to be that safety that's coming down and buzzing down over the middle of the field and taking that portion away, it's probably going to be Buda Baker. So kind of keep tabs on him. Um, young corners, young secondary on the outside. Sean Murphy Bunting is a player that came out of Central. He was at Tennessee. He's now there at Arizona, but his biggest problem is he can't stay healthy. But they got one of my guys, Max Melton, big fan of him when he was coming out of Rutgers. So we'll see what they do. Uh, looking at some of the data, like I did last week, you know, the Buccaneers in week one of what they did. Now looking at the Cardinals of what they did in week one, I don't have that data yet for week two because it's only Monday night. Yeah. But in week one, the Cardinals, they only blitzed 29.5% of the time. And that was against Josh Allen and, and the Tampa, or the Tampa Bills and the, and the Buffalo Bills. So obviously that might increase a little bit with a, a more pocket passer. But when you look at just coverages and those types of things, the Cardinals run a lot of cover one and cover three and quarters coverage. Uh, 24.6% of the time, on, time, 24.6% of the time on cover one. 26.2% of the time on cover three and 23% of their coverages are quarter coverage. So it's somewhat similar to what the Buccaneers were doing. The Buccaneers are a kind of a blend of cover zero because of how much they blitz yeah. uh, and cover one. And actually the Cardinals ran cover zero quite a bit, 13.1% of the time. So that was in week one. So I'm throwing a lot of numbers out there. You might have to slow that down, but I, I just, the Lions can figure this out offensively. Use Sam Laporta a little bit. Tim Patrick looked good, not great, but it was nice to see him going. So spread the football out a little bit. Don't throw it 55 times. Run the ball a little bit more. And I think the Lions should be able to bounce back and have a good road win and and get to two and one, get above 500 and kind of get everybody back on the bandwagon. I don't know if you're feeling that same way offensively. That's how I'm feeling. It's, and to me, this, this feels like a, Tough matchup that could go either way. It, again, it, it, you know, I think we'll say this just about every week. If the Lions play a good football game, they'll win. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, you know, both sides of the ball. They're going to give up plays. They're going to, you know, that's the that's what Kyler Murray does. Is going to he's going to run around long enough to to make plays, right? Yeah. It's just can you overcome that, um, and then can you be? just as effective as they are on offense or if not more effective you know this is where this is where games like scripting is really important um if if, if this were a high school game and you and I were on the lions uh, uh you know if you and I were on the o line were if you're the coordinator on on the o line coach or whatever i'm telling you we need to be a run heavy offense this week cuz we don't want their offense to have the ball right. right so let's take the air out of the ball run the hell out of the ball Slow it down, yeah. right? So yeah. if we can, if any way, I'm not going to say we because the Lions, if the Lions can reduce possessions 
for Carolina's off okay, Carolina for Arizona's offense, that will be like significant to how this game yeah. plays out. Just yeah. you know, it's not to think about. Go. I mean, well, maybe this is one of the weeks where they just go heavy run because right. of, because of Arizona's offense, and I think that makes sense. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's it's very possible. I mean, when you look at just like the history of going out to Arizona, I was talking to my dad today and I was like, I feel like whenever they go to Arizona, they struggle and all those types of deals. And it's actually recently, it hasn't been that bad. Out of the last three road trips that they've taken to Arizona of 2018, 2019, and 2020, and I get it, completely different teams, but they're 2-0-1. Oh, they actually tied and then they've won two games out West. So I, th- look, the Lions, they travel well, they they can compete, and Dan Campbell, look, he's taken accountability, and the last time he took accountability for a loss and those types of things, the, the Lions end up coming out and playing really well, and I think that's going to be the case. I mean, very similar defenses, Cardinals have given up 298 yards of, of uh, offense to their defense, and then the Lions have given up 301, so They're damn near identical in both departments. The Lions are better against the run. I I like this matchup for Detroit, and I I know we got some worries about Kyler Murray. Like you said, they're going to get some splash plays, some big plays. They're going to make it happen. But at the end of the day, the Lions have been very good with this bend don't break mentality on defense the last two weeks. And when they need a stop, they make a stop. And it it just it feels like these got these these corners especially are due for some bigger pass breakups, some interceptions, and those types of things. And I think Tieran Arnold could maybe have a big day, or Meek Robinson, or even Carlton Davis. He needs a bounce back spot. He didn't play great yesterday either. So yeah. I, I like the opportunities for the defense, and obviously I think the offense is going to figure it out. They're going to be just fine. So I feel good about it going into it, but definitely, as we talked about, offensive execution has got to get better yeah. as we go along. I mean, the last thing uh, I'll say, and then I'm good, is – uh it's maybe not a bad time to have to go on the road, right? You had all the emotion of the of the Sunday night opener. You had the disappointment of the loss at home this week. Yeah. Get on the road, get away from home. You know, um, it's not a bad thing. Maybe it's a good time for them to do it in the season. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it I think it is. And you gotta, yeah, you gotta mix it up. You maybe get out on the road and in the plane, whatever, get out west and just have that bonding experience as a team and kind of sort things out and get away from all of the distractions. Yeah. You're at yeah. you're at home, like you said, Sunday night. A lot of distractions back here. You're going out to dinner with the family. Now you're going out to all of it. Yeah. 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 So uh and, and maybe that's why, you know, they're settling for tens at the beach because they're at home and they're trying to be flashy rather than taking those sixes and sevens. So hopefully they sort that out. We will see. But Good show. I love it. I, I love that we were able to review this. We didn't get too mad or frustrated. I'm not that upset uh, and obviously still excited about Sunday and the season as we go. Yeah. Do you have anything else, my man? No, we're good. All right. Well, as got you guys, as always, you can follow us on Twitter or X at Russ NFL Draft or at Bischoff underscore Scott. And you can rate, review, and subscribe to the Detroit Lions podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other podcast platforms. Stay patient. Stay calm. We'll figure this out. Go Lions. We will talk to you guys next week, hopefully after a win against the Arizona Cardinals. 